Welcome to the stage, comedian and activist Josh Burstein. So, has anyone played around with ChatGPT and thought, this thing's going to help me become the ambassador of the dolphin race? Well, our next speaker certainly sees the promise in these robots to helping us speak to nature. He is the co-founder of Earth Species Project, a nonprofit dedicated to translating animal communications. He's also co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology, which was featured in the documentary, The Social Dilemma. To discuss how we can use AI to learn from other species, it's the co-host of the hit podcast, Your Undivided Attention. Please give exactly that for Aza Raskin. Thanks so much, brother. Good morning, everyone. I'm so impressed. We're all awake somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see how awake you are by the end. I think we might be able to bring up a little bit. Um, so, as you know, my name is Aza Raskin. Uh, all my contact information is up there. Run Earth Species Project, which has the cute acronym of ESP, which is probably on purpose. <laughs> um, does anyone know what animal makes this sound? No? A good guess? No? 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 Close? Yes. It is. Oh, nice. Thank you. Oh, that really helps. Isn't that guy cute? <laughs> this is a bearded seal making the sounds of like the 1950s uh, UFOs. By the way, that was the mating call of the bearded seal. So if you're excited, now you know where to go. <laughs> um, but I love starting here because that's such a wild sound, right? We don't normally think of the incredible diversity of communication that exists on this planet. It like helps us open the aperture of the human mind. And our goal, right? is not just can we learn to listen from animals, but can we unlock communication to transform our relationship with the rest of nature? The, this idea actually started um, in uh, 2013. I was driving my gold station wagon Volvo, uh, and I heard an NPR piece about gelato monkeys, which I'd never heard about before. They, they're these guys. They have these huge manes, giant fangs. They live in groups of like 2,000 fission fusion groups. And the uh, researcher, Morgan Gustinson, who was researching them, said that they had the largest vocabulary of any primate except humans. They sound like women and children babbling. They sound a little bit like this. Let's see. Did it work? And... <laughs> And they do this incredible like lip smacking thing that like mimics humans, like moving our mouths to modulate our sound. And the researchers swear that the animals talk about them behind their back, which <laughs> is probably true. And I was like, well, why are they out there with a hand recorder, hand transcribing, trying to figure out what they're saying? Shouldn't we be using, you know, like machine learning and uh, microphone arrays to go figure this out? And when I started looking into it, at that point, machines couldn't do something that human beings couldn't already do. They couldn't translate a language that didn't already have a translation. I'll get to like the punchline of what changed in 2017 that said now is the time to start going. But I just want to say, you know, mycelial networks have like mushrooms, like the weird fruiting bodies that come forward, but it's really like the the things under the ground that do all the work. I feel the same way. I'm the weird fruiting body you see in front of you. Um, but the real work happens from like this incredible team uh, behind me. And since we got going in 2017, where really it was just us on our own, it's really grown. There are now two books out about this topic. We, there's a huge set of people and partners working on this. There is a wave that is coming that will crash in the next couple of years. And it's incredibly exciting. So core of the thought, if there's, there are going to be two sort of main thoughts to hold throughout this talk. And one is our ability to understand is limited 
by our ability to perceive. If we can throw open the apertures of what we can perceive, that throws open the aperture of what we can understand. I always like to start this way. Whenever I'm feeling a little ego for it, I'm like, okay, but how much of a reality am I actually experiencing? And, and here is this. So time, this is a ridiculous chart, but time is on the left, all of it. Time, uh, space is on the bottom, all of it. And the human experience occupies a tiny little fraction of what we can perceive, which means what we can understand. And to give a sense of this, like, do you guys think that flowers can hear the sound of approaching bees? Like, do you think plants can hear? I'm getting some, I mean, technically this is a leading question, so you are all correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, but researchers in 2019 did this at University of Tel Aviv and they took a primrose flower and they would play different sounds to the flower and they would play, you know, like traffic noises, low noises, bat noises, high noises, and then the sounds of approaching pollinator. And only when they approached or played the sounds of an approaching pollinator did the flowers respond and they respond by producing more and sweeter nectar within just a couple of seconds, right? So the flowers hear the bee through its petals and get excited. Okay, so plants can hear, and actually there's another incredible study that the same uh, university did right after, where they're like, okay, but can they speak? And so they actually stressed out tobacco plants. Um, they would either like cut them or dehydrate them, sort of plant torture. Um, and when they did, the more dehydrated that the plants got, the more they would emit sound. Um, these, and not quietly, it's at the sound of human hearing. Um, just up at 50 or 60 kilohertz so we can't hear. So whenever I'm wandering now through like a dry California uh, meadow, I'm like the plants are hearing, the pants are emitting sound. Like the world is awash in signal and meaning that we're just completely unaware of, but on the cusp of really diving into, because these are just the first sets of experiments. All right, so plants emit sound, they respond to sound. Uh, pea plants actually are known, if you uh, put their roots into a plastic bag, the roots will still move towards the sound of running water. So th this is everywhere. But how about this? So there's this uh, 2013 study uh, discovered this vine, it's actually a very common vine in South America, Bochila trifiolata. And what's interesting about this plant is that it mimics the leaves of the plant that it grows on. So if it's growing on a red plant, it'll change its leaves to be red. If it has like three lobes, it'll change its leaves to have three lobes. Took a while for at least Western scientists to discover it because it camouflages. But then there was a huge debate, okay? If it can change its leaves to mimic what it's growing on and it will change to, you know, in the same, same vine, how is it doing it? Maybe it's volatile chemicals and it's pre-programmed. It wasn't until 2020 that, you know, a scientist realized, hey, shouldn't, let's just try growing this thing on an artificial plant. Can it still mimic the leaves of an artificial plant? And the answer is yes. It'll change the color, shape, and size of its leaves, even from an artificial plant. And they're like process of elimination. Like, how is it doing this? And the only thing that the scientists can come up with are acelli, which is a face-saving term in biology for eyes. That they believe that the plants can literally see what they're growing on and mimic. And actually it was Darwin who first hypothesized that plants could use their cell walls as a kind of lens to focus light to see. Okay, so plants can see here emit sound, <laughs> maybe it's not so ridiculous to think that animals communicate and have some kind of rich, deep language. But still, how do we know that there is a there there, right? And this is a study from University of Hawaii, 1994, um, and it's, it's fascinating. They, here they taught dolphins two gestures. And the first gesture was do something you've never done before, right? Innovate. Hard enough to teach that to humans. <laughs> and the dolphins do it. And that's, think about the cognitive load for that, right? Because you have to remember everything you've done that session, 
You have to understand the concept of negation, not one of those things, and then invent a new thing you've never done before, but dolphins will do it. And then they give a second gesture, do something together. And they'll say to dolphin pairs, do something you've never done before together. And the dolphins go down, exchange information, come out and do the same thing they've never done before at the same time. Right? And that doesn't prove representational language, but like Occam's razor, like it's sort of on the, the, the null hypothesis now on the other foot. Like we have to sort of show how they would do that if it wasn't using some kind of rich symbolic communication. The study got us so excited. They, by the way, they, they replicated this over multiple dolphin pairs. Um, so it has replicability. Unfortunately, when they did it, they didn't record the audio. And so now there are groups of scientists that are starting to work to recreate this experiment. Okay, but I, I said something happened in 2017, right? That said, now is the time to go. How can AI possibly help translate a language that doesn't already have a translation? How do you translate a language that doesn't have a Rosetta Stone or any examples? Well, that was impossible until 2017. And to understand this, because in 2017, it was discovered by two papers back to back, that AI could translate between two human languages, any two human languages, without the need for any examples or a Rosetta Stone. It's deeply profound. What I want to do now is walk you through that process. So you have an understanding of how that works. And if you want to have a deep understanding of an AI, of AI and how it works, remember this one thing: that AI turns semantic relationships into geometric relationships. Well, Okay, what, what does that mean? Semantic relationship into geometric relationship. So this is English. This is the top 10,000 most spoken words in English. So imagine, you know, every star is a, a, a word and words that mean similar things are near each other. Words that share a semantic relationship share a geometric relationship. So king is to man as woman is to queen. So in this shape, king is the same distance direction to man as woman is to queen. And so you can just do king minus man plus woman equals queen, or plus boy equals prince, or plus girl equals princess. Semantic relationship into geometric relationship. The first thing I ever tried when I got my hands on this data set, the technical term for these things, by the way, is a latent space or an embedding space. But I tried, okay, hipster <laughs> minus authenticity. <laughs> Add that to conservative. And the computer spat out electability, right? Yeah. Computers should not write better jokes than we can. <laughs> All right, so more examples just to get the hang of it. Malodorous is the pretentious way of saying smelly. You do a malodorous my smelly, get this gives you pretentiousness as a relationship, add it to book equal tome, add it to clever equal adroit. And if you want to get a conceptual understanding of how this works, because the computer doesn't know what anything means, it just knows how things relate. So if you're looking at lots and lots and lots of text, right, and you saw this word ice, and you say, oh, ice appears next to this other word cold uh, often, but ice does not appear next to fashion often, and if I divide those two ratios, I get some hint that ice and cold are more related than ice and fashion. And that's the basic way that this stuff gets built. Of course, it gets more advanced when you move into AI, but what that means is that if you think about the point which is dog, well, it has a relationship to friend and to guardian, to howl, to yelp, and to wolf, and to man. It sort of fixes it in a point in space. And if you solve the problem of every concept relation to every other concept, it's like solving a massive multi-dimensional Sudoku puzzle and out pops a rigid structure that represents all the internal relationships of a language. Okay, that's cool, <laughs> but what would you do with that? Well, the shape, which is, say, Spanish, can't possibly be the same shape as English, right? If you talk to anthropologists, they would say they have different cultures, different cosmologies, different ways of viewing the world, different ways of gendering verbs, obviously gonna be different shapes. But, you know, the, the AI researchers were like, whatever, let's just try. 
and they took the shape which is Spanish and the shape which is English and they literally rotated them on top of each other and the point which is dog ended up in the same spot in both. Yeah. And you're like, okay, but Spanish and English are super related. Let's try that with Japanese. And even though there are definitely words in Japanese that don't exist in English and don't exist in Spanish, if you blur your eyes, the shapes are still the same. And in fact, that's not just true of English and Japanese and Spanish, but Urdu and Aramaic and Finnish. Um, pretty much every human language that's been tried ends up fitting in a kind of universal human meaning shape, which I think is just so profound especially in this time of such deep division, that there is a universal hidden structure underlying us all. Okay, well, the obvious next step is, can we build one of these kinds of shapes for animal communication? And I just should point out that this is like 2017 technology, which is essentially Stone Age and AI. So there are many more techniques that have merged since here, but I, th I think it's really helpful to hold this in your mind because it gives like an intuition for how this kind of stuff works. Um, okay, if we could build the shape that represents animal communication, well, maybe there's some part of that shape that overlaps with how human beings communicate and see the world because language is crystallized shadow of mind it is a model of the world, and to the extent that we live in the same world, maybe there's an overlap, and the parts that overlap would be a direct translation to the human experience, and the parts that don't overlap would sort of like stick out, and we could see that there is rich structure there, but we wouldn't be able to directly translate, and I still don't know which of these two things would be more fascinating. Because you know, whales and dolphins have had culture passed down vocally for 34 million years. Humans have only been speaking vocally and passing on culture for like 200,000 years tops. Like, and that which is oldest correlates with that which is wisest. So there's probably some very deep truth that's embedded in a 34 million year old culture. By the way, whales and dolphins have uh, dialects that drift far enough apart that they become mutually unintelligible languages. Um, there's a great case that happens generally yearly off the coast of Norway when a group of false killer whales speaking some way, and a group of dolphins speaking their own different way, come together and hunt in a superpod, and are speaking a third different way. So let's go figure out what that overlap is. But you could say the world of an animal is so different, their umwelt is so different, their sensory is so different, we shouldn't expect any overlap. But I think that's a kind of human exceptionalism. So here's an example. Do you guys know the mirror test? This is where you, these are dolphins looking in a mirror. You paint a dot on a dolphin. Um, I love this because this is definitely a universal experience of looking in a mirror <laughs> and checking out your abs. <laughs> but this, this, um, this test is you, you paint the dot on an animal. You, they don't know about it until they look in a mirror. They look in the mirror and they're like, oh, what's that thing? And that means that they have to recognize the image that they see in the mirror with themselves. That is me. Self-awareness, right? One of the most profound experiences you can possibly have. And if they're communicating, then they may well be communicating about a rich interiority. So that is shared with animals. Uh, dolphins, elephants, um, a number of other species will, will pass this. These guys are lemurs taking hits off of centipedes. So they bite centipedes, literally get high, and they go into these trance-like states. I'm sure this is not at all familiar to anyone here. <laughs> um, they get super cuddly uh, and then later wake up and go their way, but they are seeking a kind of transcendent state of consciousness. Apes will spin. They will hang on vines and spin to get dizzy. And then dolphins will intentionally inflate pufferfish to get high, pass them around in the ultimate pus puff pass. <laughs> right? Many mammals seek a transcendent 
altered state of being. And if they communicate, they may well communicate about it. This is too early in the morning to give this example, but this is a pilot whale carrying her dead young. This is week three. So grief is an experience that's shared. And to not end on that note, we have to go another way. This is an orangutan watching a magic trick and just see if you recognize this behavior. <laughs> Which is definitely me at all magic shows. <laughs> so like surprise and delight at having your expectations frustrated, that is another shared experience and presumably some kind of gentle hatred of magicians. <laughs> right? So there is a lot that is conserved and there's a lot that's not. And so that's sort of what we're moving towards, but to actually build this shape takes a lot of work because it turns out real world data is super messy. So I'll, here's, another, here's another guessing game. What animal makes this noise? No, but you're in the right sort of ballpark. It is a type of whale. It's sort of white, it has a melony head. Yeah, nice, it's a beluga. These are a couple belugas hunting and communicating. And to me, it sounds like an alien modem. Right? This is nothing in there is digital. That was just a microphone stuck in water. We can hear up to 20 kilohertz. They're speaking up to 150 kilohertz. Um, it turns out dolphins have names. There's a 2016 study of Ian Yannick that showed that they not only have names that they address each other by, but they will use them in the third person. Belugas only recently were discovered to have names, and in their call, they put both their unique identifier and their clan identifier. But unlike a dolphin whose signature whistle is what it's called, is their name, and it's just a whistle, these guys have these broadband modem-like packets. Um, now, here's the surprising thing. This is the one that like made my eyes get really wide, because the woman who did this research, Valeria Vergara, Dr. Ver Valeria Vergara said, even though she has tags that she puts on the animals that record like video and audio um, and kinematics, even though she has that, she still has to throw away 97% of her data because she can't tell who's speaking or because they're overlapping, right? And they can't separate them out to do analysis. Only 3% of beluga communication from these data sets are explored. Like the ocean is more explored than that. The moon is more explored than that. This is so exciting. The most vocal underwater animal has the super majority of data never analyzed by Western science. Oh my God. But that means if we wanna start doing this work, we're gonna to have to figure out how do we separate out each of the individual tracks from the animal so that we can do analysis. That's been impossible. So one of our first papers was actually doing exactly this. So this is an example It works on bats, it works with elephants, um, starting to work with humpback whales. But these are two dogs that are barking at the same time. And then you'll see the AI that we trained to separate it out into their own individual tracks. So together. And then separate. So you can imagine, this is a, like we're at this like cusp of a moment as we move this from being able to work with lab-like data to real life data, that we're about to have access sort of like to the new telescope to look out at the universe and get to discover all the things that were invisible to us before. What we can understand is limited by our ability to perceive.
and AI is throwing open the aperture of what we can perceive. I sort of think about it at this moment, like um, there's that moment in 1995, uh, I think it was late December, when Hubble telescope was pointed at that empty patch in sky. And what was discovered was the most galaxies we'd ever seen before in one spot. Right? We pointed at nothing, and what we found was everything. There are so many blank spots in what human beings know, and I think what we're going to discover when we look at nature is everything. Freeman Dyson had this to say about how do scientific revolutions happen. And he said, in the last 500 years, we've had six major concept-driven scientific revolutions. And in that time, there have been about 20 tool-driven revolutions. Right? Science progresses generally not because of a thing that we see, but because we increase our ability to perceive. And it's not just for us about getting to, you know, it's sort of like you go to the moon, but you also invent Velcro. So <laughs> our goal here is to not just like, let's get to the end goal of transiting animal communication, but animal space, biology, conservation, deeply underfunded. And so if we can just act as a bridge between like the AI world and the incredible resources of, you know, tech in the valley and conservation ethology, I think that can do a whole bunch. So in the last you know, four years, I guess five years now, um, there are these things called foundation models that sort of like what chat, GPT, all these other models are built on large scale models that are trained on just raw data to discover the fundamental patterns of vocabulary to describe what they're seeing. And they've been transforming the human world. So this is the number of foundation models that have been used for the, you know, papers in the top journals um, in NLP. And in 2018, you know, it was around 4% of papers were based on foundation models. In 2020, 90% were, and that number has continued to shoot up into 2023. And at the same time, in the non-human domain, it's essentially been zero. And actually, it went up in 2022 because we've published the first one. And the goal here is, hey, if we can make these kinds of large-scale models for the rest of nature, then we should expect a kind of broad scale acceleration. I don't know whether it'll be 20%, 50%, 90%. And to the extent that con like conservation research, ethology research already helps with conservation outcomes, then doing this kind of work should do a broad scale acceleration of all conservation. So it's sort of, you know, go to the moon, also invent Velcro. These are our first two papers on this. This is the first major paper um, of benchmarks of animal sounds. Essentially, if you don't have a yardstick, how do you know when you're getting better? Like all of machine learning is sort of built on this kind of thing. Um, didn't exist for animal communication, so we made it. This is AVs, the very first um, foundation model for animal communication, and it's already helping change things. This is just a lot of numbers because I knew you guys woke up early and wanted to see it. <laughs> Um, but essentially all it says is that the thing we built down at the bottom has all the bold lines is uh, beating all the other uh, methods out there. But it's already hard, starting to help us do things like build these kinds of language clouds. In this case, it's for beluga communication so that the different types of calls that they make can be automatically separate out, separated out because these tools help you do classification, detection, source separation, denoising, all the things that biologists need to do. So we're pretty excited about that. For those who came to the talk yesterday, I think this will this is where like we sort of like dovetail for just a second, which is, I think, a question that you might have in your mind is, okay. You've convinced me that we can translate between human languages without the need for Rosetta Stone. And I can see that maybe there's a way that you could do some translation and some parts will overlap and some parts won't. But can you really translate to something that has no, like a whale that's like, you know, a kilometer deep? Their world is so different. And here's where I think the everything as language is really key because this kind of aligning shapes 
it doesn't just work only for language, it works for everything. It's an incredibly deep thing, right? So you probably, probably saw this at least yesterday that AI used to have separate fields. This is great when I get to reuse slides. Um, speech recognition, computer vision, robotics, music generation were all different fields that changed also in 2017 when they became one thing language where you could learn to treat the text of internet as just a sequence of words. That's language code is the sequences of characters, it's a type of language. Um, DNA is just a sequence of um, base pairs, it's a language. And what AI is learning to do is translate to and from all of them. So give an example of how this works. You know, when you've seen, the, you type in an Im, a text and out comes an image, how does that work? Well, you ask the computer to build a shape that represents language, then you ask the computer to build a shape that represents images. And to, to give a sense of, right, when I said turns semantic relationships into geometric relationships, how does that work? Let's just focus in for a second on human faces. Imagine you have a database of human faces. You turn that into a shape. That means there's a relationship between you know your face and your face, which is smiling. If I actually take your face and the your face, which is smiling, and I subtract them, I get the relationship, which is smilingness. And then add that to any face in this shape, and it'll give me the smiling version of that shape. There is a direction that represents oldness, youngness, maleness, femaleness, bangness. Um, so what happens then when you build these shapes for language, for images, you then look at all the image caption pairs on the internet, and now it's not a rotation anymore, but it is linear transform. It's like a squishing and a rotation. And if you do that, you get a correspondence between these two. So when you say portrait of Chile as a person, it finds the spot in language space, it translates it over to the image space, and then you say computer, one image would go here, generate the, the image that's at this point, and that's how you get this. So it's not just language to language that lets you match these kinds of embedding spaces, these shapes to do translation, it's everything. And that helps you understand how this worked, right? Where, you know, on the left is, you know, the human seeing an image. That's the fMRI pattern. From seeing the image, you give the computer only the ability to see the fMRI pattern, and it creates, you know, this giraffe shape. It's working because it's built a shape that represents all of the internal relationships of fMRIs. You have fMRI shape, you have image shape, you just match the two of them, and that's how you can translate between. So that gives you a sense of the kind of deep power of this technique. And actually, I think there's something even deeper going on here, but this is just a hypothesis. There's a thing called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Like, why is it the case that you go off and you invent complex numbers and quaternions and do abstract algebra, and somehow that has something to say about the physical world? Still a mystery. But there's an unreasonable effectiveness of deep learning. There is no a priori reason why DNA and images and video and speech synthesis and fMRI should share a kind of universal shape, but they do. And I think that's telling us something very deep about the structure of the universe. This was my face when I saw all of this, by the way. <laughs> Right? AI is learning how to decode, translate, and synthesize the languages of reality, which is both terrifying and rad, which is what the future is like, terrifying and rad. So uh, we actually just uh, won the National Geographic Explorer Award um, for doing this kind of work where we're turning motion into meaning so that we can translate now not just from what an animal says into what another thing an animal says, but into how they move. Um, so this is actually one of our partners, Ari Friedlander, and he's in Antarctica tagging whales. So these are devices that have video, that have audio, that have kinematics, how they move. They're very mesmerizing. Um, and this gives us a wealth of data to make multimodal models that lets you translate to and from 
what an animal says to how a pod of animals might move or how a pod of animal moves to what they say. Um, we've also just done the first big benchmark for how do you turn like all of that motion into, into meaning. You can see the way that we approach this is fundamentally, we're, we're, we think of ourselves like the Switzerland or the mycelial network. Like we're a nonprofit, we are not in academia, we're not a startup, we sit in between everything and that lets us just collaborate with everyone. And so what we're doing now is we're starting to build the ability to translate between motion and video and uh, what animals are saying. And that's us do things like, we haven't got here yet, but we're, we're getting there. Given this motion for an animal, what sound might it make? An example, two whales coming together. What sound do they make? That might mean hello. If a whale dives, what sound would the other whales have to make to make that whale dive? And that would mean maybe it means dive. Maybe it means there's danger up here. Maybe it means there's food down there, but it has something to do with diving. Or you could say, generate me the audio of two elephants coming together. Okay, now do it again, but where the ears are flapping and the elephant is running faster. And you can start to see how this gets you very quickly towards the ability to decode. And then you combine that with the ability to align shapes and you can get up into the abstractions. Oh, sorry. So where do we go from here? So now we've talked about how we can translate motion into meaning. We've talked about how you can sort of align shapes, but we sort of need the final step here. How do we test our hypothesis? How do we get to two-way communication? Would you guys like to know how to say hello and how back well? All right, on the condition that we use it all over the boat as often as possible. The way you say hello and humpback whale well is <clears throat> please. Hello to you guys too. Um, and that's what she did. She went out and she played whoops, um, two humpbacks and indeed they respond. But we're sort of at this speak and spell level of communication. Like we can record audio and play it back. Maybe we change some frequencies, but it'd be really nice to get to like two way fluent conversation, right? So I, I want to tell this story because this is a photo I took um, one morning on Alaska. I was on a boat. Um, we were out there for, you know, almost two weeks and we were following the humpbacks and we hadn't seen them. We hadn't seen them. We'd see sort of one off in the distance. We recorded audio, um, one day and the next day we weren't driving this trip. We were, we were sort of passengers learning how it was done. We're helping these scientists. Um, and this particular morning it was very foggy. The sun came out and it was like vivid white light. Um, and birds are just flying out of nowhere, going to nowhere. And you could hear the humpbacks breathing because they sound, they're like, <laughs> when they get up there, they sound sort of like a mix of Darth Vader doing a yoga class. It's a very specific vibe. Um, and then we started this experiment. We were playing something and we actually didn't know what we were playing because we we're keeping it double blind. We were standing on the boat top looking and we're supposed to record where the humpbacks were, uh, how far away they were. They start the experiment and almost instantly a humpback around 30 meters away lunges at its, the boat with its mouth half open. And we had never seen that behavior before. And then it goes down, comes across and from the other side of the boat comes back with the same lunging behavior. And for 10 minutes, it was moving back and around the boat, around the boat, the experiment stops, we stop playing anything, and we just see the humpback beeline away. And we go downstairs like, what happened? And it turns out you can identify humpbacks by sort of their fluke, they have a fluke print, like we have a fingerprint. And it turned out that, you know, this humpback, humans had given it the name Twain, that we were playing Twain's own hello back to himself. We did this accidentally, it's so like an audio mirror. And our speaker, you saw it, it's sort of small. And so on the recording, you can hear us go, I'm Twain. And then the humpback going, I'm Twain. I'm Twain, oh, I'm Twain. 
And can you imagine how psychedelic that must have been to like live 38 years and then encounter yourself in the ocean? You're like, this is not okay. Um, <laughs> we, we felt just a little crappy. Um, but it was fascinating to experience. But this is the point, is that we are at speak and spell level, right? That is the state of the art, is record and play back. And imagine going to a foreign country and trying to order food with one of these things. It just wouldn't really go or having meaningful conversation. So where we're heading to now is two-way communication, but not directly human to animal, AI to animal, and then using that to help decode. And there's some really, as you can tell from that story, interesting ethics that comes out of, from this, which I'll dive into in a second. But we gave this demonstration also yesterday, but in the last couple of months, this is four months of, uh, ago, the ability to listen to three seconds of anyone's voice and then continue speaking their voice began. So here's the prompt. This is real. First impressions of people are, in nine cases out of 10, and then synthetic. mere spectacle reflections of the actuality of things but they are impressions of something. And then the same thing, but with piano, piano prompt, real, synthetic. You just can't tell. So then the obvious next idea is like, well, can we do that for animal communication? And of course the answer is yes. And just like you can build a chatbot in Chinese without needing to speak Chinese. In the next couple of years, you know, one, three, five, we're gonna be able to build essentially synthetic whales, synthetic tool using crows that can fluently speak. It's just the plot twist is we won't yet fully know what we're saying. So bizarre, I would not have predicted this. Um, so this is examples, so these are chip chaps and you can hear the prompt and then synthetic. Prompt. We can't tell. The question is, of course, will the animals be able to tell? Um, here's, here's us doing it with humpback whales. So prompt and then synthetic. Prompt. Can't really tell. Um, that, by the way, was a version of hello, which I'm sure you can all translate now. Think about it a little bit like this, and I think this is helpful to when you're looking at chat GPT or these other things. It's not that they have an understanding, it's they have the ability to mimic or emulate having an understanding. So this is like having a superpower. Imagine your superpower is you could walk up to anyone speaking any language you don't understand, and you sit there for a while just listening, and you're like, okay, I sort of see when they say this kind of sound, then this kind of sound, this kind of sound, then that kind of sound, and you're like, got it. And you just babble. You have no idea what you're saying, but the other person's sitting there being like, yes. And it looks like they have a really meaningful conversation and they walk away and you're like, I still, I know, it's just speaking light language, whatever that is. Um, I'm babbling, but they understand. That's what we'll get to here. And it's profound because that means really in the next 12 to 48 months, we will cross whatever this conversational barrier is. It's, I think, problematic to call it first contact because indigenous cultures obviously have been having communication for a long time. Um, we have communication with you know, our, our pets, but something fundamentally new is happening here where I think we are going to get to experience and understand the cultures of Earth that human beings have never really been able to see or hear or understand. And that's, we are on the very cusp of that happening. But problem, humpback whales, their song goes viral. Like for whatever reason, Australian humpbacks are like the K-pop singers. And whatever song is sung off the coast of Australia will get picked up and often sung by the world population within a season or two. It's a particularly catchy tune because they sing halfway across the ocean basin. There's actually this fascinating uh, zone in the ocean called the Sofar Channel, it's where things work just out, uh, just right for it to be a um, sort of like a fiber optic cable. And whales will go down there and speak over a thousand kilometers back and forth in this channel. 
Plus, they migrate halfway around the world. So that gives you a sense of like how these songs can go viral. So if we're not careful, if we just create a synthetic whale that sings, we may fuck up a 34 million year old culture. We may create the equivalent of like whale QAnon. We probably shouldn't do that. Um, and what that means is that to actually start this work means starting more in the lab with animals that don't socially learn and building our way up so that at every step of the way we know what we're saying before we go out into the wild and start trust blithely trying to communicate. And I think it's really interesting that it's so easy for us to see how easy it is for us to mess up animal cultures and how much harder it us is for us to see that when we have these things just blathering to humans, that we're gonna mess up our own. I think, well, before I get into this, I think there's a huge opportunity in storytelling, which I'm excited about, which is in order to show up to the newfound power of being able to communicate, requires a different kind of responsibility, right? And the whole point of this project is to change the way that we relate to the rest of nature and to realize, to have everyone on the planet realize that we can have two-way conversation with animals that have a rich culture and rich symbolic language is to shift our relationship. So you can imagine a kind of prime directive or a Geneva Convention for cross-species communication that we should probably work on before we get to the actual ability to do the communication. And then imagine telling that story on the world stage, a kind of like a, a social dilemma or something else, but now for talking with animals. I always think about the number of people that come up to me and talk about my octopus teacher and how that's shifted their behavior. Imagine what we can do when we tell this next version of that story at global scale. Like that gets me so excited. And then you pair that with, you know, rights for nature, personhood for non-humans, Eel Wilson half earth. Um, I think there's a way of using the power of the story we're talking about now to superpower the theories of change of everyone else who's already out there working in climate that I think is super exciting. The way I've been thinking about it is that AI, I mean, AI is like everything. It's a, it's a hard thing to pin down in a metaphor, but I think in this case, AI is like the invention of modern optics, right? Because optics gave us two things. It first let us like create microscopes and discover all of the world of like germs and viruses, like a completely unknown thing. But even more so, it gave us the telescope. And what did the telescope do? The telescope let us look out at the patterns of the universe, and what did we discover? We discovered that Earth was not the center. This time, we're gonna look out at the patterns of the universe, and what are we gonna discover? Yeah, that humans are not the center. And even if we could draw down all of the carbon tomorrow, if we had that technology, and we should do it, it wouldn't fix the core generator function, which is human ego. And so I think of this project as a kind of project, and there is no silver bullet. These are complex systems. Maybe there's no silver bullet, but maybe there is silver buckshot. This is one of the pellets that can help shift how we think about ourselves in relationship to the cosmos and this tiny planet we live on. This is, I think, the next frontier. Sometimes I think our telescopes are pointed the wrong direction. That if we really want to understand that we are not alone, we need to be looking in our oceans and in our backyards. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.